Good afternoon. On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to today's Tips from the Toolbox webinar, Healthcare Acquired Pneumonia in Long-Term Care. My name is Terry Roberts, and I am the moderator for today's web conference, which is scheduled for 30 minutes, including questions and answers. I would like to introduce you to Joanne Atkins. Joanne is a registered nurse and an infection prevention analyst for the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority. Joanne's clinical experience and roles include critical care, dialysis, and quality improvement in infection prevention. She has been the manager of infection prevention and control for several years at an acute care hospital. She is certified in, in infection prevention and control. I will now turn the presentation over to Joanne. Thank you, Terry. Welcome, everyone, to the first webinar in a new series we're doing called Tips from the Toolbox. This will be a series of 30-minute webinars highlighting some of the tools available for your use from the Patient Safety Authority. This slide's listing our objectives for today. Today, we're going to discuss one of the most serious healthcare-acquired infections in long-term care residents, pneumonia. Pneumonia in nursing home residents is associated with a high case fatality rate and has considerable mor mortality among the survivors. The clinical presentation of nursing home acquired pneumonia is considered to be atypical, but thoughts are this may be caused by patients being dement having dementia. So when we talk about pneumonia, it is the second most common cause of infection among nursing home residents, but it ca carries the highest mortality rate of any infection. And it is also a very common reason for hospital transfer and admission for these patients. There are studies that show the mortality rate for nursing home residents who are admitted to the hospital with a nursing home acquired pneumonia is anywhere from 13 to 41%. When it comes to pneumonia, the most common pathogens in the elderly are gram-negative bacteria, and strep pneumonia is the most common, followed by Haemophilus influenza. The incidence of nursing home acquired pneumonia is anywhere reported from 0.3 to 2.5 cases per 1,000 resident days. Now, this variation in the range could be related to different things, but some of the things that are thought to cause that are differences in the study designs, the number of facilities that were evaluated, or the intensity of the surveillance that was performed. Pneumonia, of course, is the second, is second most common cause of infection in these residents, and most episodes is caused, are caused by aspiration. When a person aspirates, the bacteria that's found in their mouth and upper respiratory system enter the lungs, and you have to have a second thing that happens. There has to be a failure of that person's defense mechanisms that make it unable for them to eliminate this aspirated bacteria. And think of your patients that may have end-stage Parkinson's or have had a stroke. They have very poor gag or cough reflex and poor swallowing mechanisms. Listed on the slide are the risk factors that lead to this pneumonia. Debilitation, cognitive decline, swallowing issues, chronic lung disease, being elderly, having some type of nasogastric tube in place, having a tracheostomy, and research has also shown that males are more likely to develop nursing home acquired pneumonia. The major risk factor among the elderly is silent aspiration. Silent aspiration occurs when patients are unable to control their secretions. Patients with um, central nervous system diseases like Parkinson's, CVA, are frequently complicated by pneumonia. This happens from impaired swallowing function or decreased gag reflex. Clues you may see that lead you to think silent aspiration is residents who develop coughing or emesis while eating, and a few hours later develop respiratory distress and a fever. One of the problems with silent aspiration is our mouths are very dirty, for lack of another better term. 
you have biofilm formation in your mouth, you carry a lot of bacteria in your mouth, and your mouth always has a continuous large bacteria load. So when you are silently aspirating, you're continually introducing bacteria into your respiratory tract. So I want to highlight the tool that's available to you that we're going to talk about today. This tool is available on our um, website, the Patient Safety Authority's webpage, on prevention of non-ventilator healthcare acquired pneumonia. This poster was developed initially for hospitals by one of my colleagues, Jim Davis, in conjunction with an article he wrote on pneumonia that's published in the Patient Safety Advisory. But when I looked at this tool, we then changed the wording on the tool, so there's now two posters available, one that does state non-ventilator hospital-acquired pneumonia, but because the information is valuable and useful for any setting, we developed a second poster, and it is non-ventilator healthcare-acquired pneumonia, and that's the one we're going to review today. One of the first things that's important to prevent this healthcare-acquired pneumonia is to prevent colonization. Listed on the slide are some of the ways to prevent colonization of the oral cavity. You want to maintain an optimal pulmonary state, and you want to make sure they have functional capacity. So we want people to be breathing as well as possible and to prevent atelectasis as much as possible. You also want to maintain the resistance to infection. As you will notice in all lectures about infection prevention, hand hygiene is always listed as one of the preventive mechanisms. Good hand hygiene is necessary not only for caregivers, but also for the residents themselves to prevent the introduction of pathogens into their oral cavity. Another important point to prevent colonization is to provide good oral care. Good oral care decreases the colonization in the mouth of potential respiratory pathogens. You also want to protect the oral and nasal passages. You want moist, healthy oral mucosa, and you want a healthy nasal passage so those tiny hair like those tiny hairs that line your mucous membranes, the cilia, can function properly. And the way they function is they wave like little fingers to help catch pathogens and move them out of the oral tract. And then you also want to have good antibiotic stewardship. The second part of the poster then talks about aspiration prevention. Aspiration prevention is vital. As we discussed before, silent aspiration is one of the major causes of pneumonia in nursing home residents. You want to optimize cough and airway clearance, so as much as possible you want to make sure the patient maintains a cough reflex. Avoid unnecessary medications that may decrease your resident's level of consciousness, which would then impact their swallowing function, their gag reflex, or their cough reflex. One of the most important ways you can prevent aspiration is to elevate the head of their bed. Keep that head of bed at 30 degrees or greater. Encourage ambulation, which also improves your respiratory function. If your resident is having difficulty with handling their secretions, then provide for suctioning to help remove some of those secretions so they're not pulling in the back of their throat and have the potential to be aspirated. And then consults if necessary to speech or swallowing professionals to help guide the type of diet the patient would be on and other ways you can help prevent aspiration. Gastroesophageal reflux is estimated to occur in approximately a third of the elderly, which then leads to the potential for aspiration. If someone aspirates material from their stomach, that does damage not only the, the trachea, but also impacts your swallowing function, your gag reflex, and your cough reflex. Another part of this poster is holistic strategies. These are holistic strategies to help prevent infection. First on the list is vaccination. 
Residents should be vaccinated for pneumococcal and influenza, and these vaccinations are vital. Pneumococcal disease is greatest in elderly people, and just remember, it is much easier to prevent an infection than it is to treat it once it occurs, and vaccination does help decrease the risk of developing influenza or pneumococcal pneumonia. One of the risk factors with influenza, one of the complications is pneumonia, which is why it's very imperative to make sure that your residents are also vaccinated for influenza. Another holistic strategy is no smoking. Smoking damages your lungs and you want optimal lung function to help aid in the prevention of pneumonia. Environmental infection control is important. You want a clean environment to help decrease any potential pathogens that could possibly enter the patient's mouth and lead to the silent aspiration, which could lead to the pneumonia. Make sure your residents are performing hand hygiene and have good personal hygiene. We want to decrease that bacterial load on the person and decrease their colonization. It is important to, to evaluate residents for risk of aspiration and then to follow the recommendations of the speech therapist on ways to help decrease that risk or prevent the aspiration. It is important to screen for dementia. People with dementia have difficulty with some of their functioning. As their dementia increases, they may have more difficulty with coughing more meds may be added, which can then just add to this continual cycle, which would um, decrease their protective mechanisms. Assess the resident's nutritional status to maintain optimal lung and physiological functioning. Make sure they have good muscle status as much as possible. And then what is really important is routine dental care. Enough cannot be said about the importance of good oral hygiene and dental care to help decrease the risk of pneumonia. You need to decrease that bio burden or the amount of bacteria present in someone's mouth to help prevent the possibility of the, um, developing the pneumonia. Our first question, Joanne. Long-term care Department of Health requires to give a pneumovax and now with the Prevnar 13 recommendations for those who have not received any pneumococcal vaccine to give the PCV 13 first and then give a PPSV 23 in a year for those over 65. How do we meet requirements for PPV 23 for the Department of Health? Thanks for the question. All adults are recommended to receive one dose of the PCV13. So that dose would be given first, and then a year later, you would follow up with the PPSV23, and you would either give one, two, or three doses. It depends on the patient, on whether they are immunocompromised or immunocompetent, and what I would refer people to is to look at the CDC's immunization schedule and I can actually send you a link for that for anyone that's interested. But that details for adults greater than 65 years of age, the number of doses required depending on whether they're immunocompromised or not. But you would need to give the, the PCV13 first. Okay, Do we have any other questions? questions? Thanks, Terry. Our next question is, why would a consult with a dental professional be recommended? Well, that's, very, that's a very easy answer. Teamwork drives positive patient outcomes. And everyone has their own level of expertise. Having examination and a cleaning done by a dental professional will not only help remove plaque, but it will identify any areas of concern that may need treatment, and they can also provide input into your care plan on what oral care needs to take place and if there's any type of additional treatment required. So there is much information out there and some very good studies on the importance of professional dental care. 
For our next question, do you have statistics on how many cases of pneumonia are associated with each, with each of the issues or risk factors listed in your slides? For example, hand hygiene or aspiration. Um, when you read the studies, the major risk factor that's listed is the silent aspiration. But all of the risk factors tie into that because you must have the hand hygiene to help prevent introducing additional bacteria into someone's oral cavity. Do I have the actual numbers in front of me? No, I do not. Okay, our next question. Why is antibiotic stewardship listed as a colonization prevention? Antibiotic stewardship is extremely important in any setting because unnecessary use of antibiotics can lead to the development of multidrug resistant organisms. As you're all well aware, infections that are caused by multidrug resistant organisms are more difficult to treat and carry greater morbidity and mortality. When you're talking about colonization of a patient, you want to decrease the amount of antibiotic exposure because then you decrease the potential to have the development of multidrug resistance. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Seeing no further questions, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. If you do have any further questions, please feel free to contact Joanne or the Authority Help Desk. This concludes our webinar.